Welcome back everybody, High Tech Lab here. Getting ready to install these lithium iron phosphate batteries. I know they are very small compared to what you'd think would be replacing all this lead acid. What I've got going on back here, I have the new program on the PLC, but kind of irrelevant to this video's topic. I have my electrical panels open. I have everything shut off and isolated from the inverter and I have a breaker tying my generator panel to my main load panel. That's feeding everything, running the ranch. That means I can go ahead and shut this inverter off. Now, one thing I wanna take note of, I'll even turn off these breakers here on the bottom of the inverter. This is my Klein Tool CL800 DC amp meter. I'll turn on the light so you guys can see better. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm on DC amp range on the clamp, and I'm gonna set this to DC mode, which it already is, and zero it out, and go ahead and clamp on this inverter. And you can see this inverter, with no load, breakers are off, drawing 3.69 amps. So sharing that for reference purposes, um, that's at a battery voltage of 56.4 volts. So uh, you could do the math and calculate your idle draw it's borderline 150 watts, so uh, I'll go ahead and put that away. New meter for me though, I like that meter a lot. So I'm gonna go ahead and shut this bad boy off and share with you guys the rest of my plans. So originally I was planning on those lithium cells just going right here on the floor. However, I've changed that thought because that would require taking all this busing apart and reconfiguring how I would be getting the power from the batteries to the inverters. And it would also mean that I could never use these lead acid cells as a backup because the busing wouldn't be in place. So here's what I'm gonna do. Even though I already put that wire way back there for the balancing leads, that's really easy to move. I'm gonna flip it over on this side of the shelf and just come out somewhere on the side of this cabinet, come across and then dive down for all my leads. Looking at it this way, you can see the two bus bars right here and right here. So I'm gonna configure these so the positive is the front bus bar for reference. So I'm gonna configure these so that the red or positive is here and that's the out positive and the out negative is right here. So then all I need to do is run a little jumper from here to the buses. I'll throw a chair lug on the bus and a chair lug on the terminal and then I'll snake around these cells and then snake back and um, get all my balance leads in there. And, and these are gonna come out of the foam. They're just there in the foam packing for easy, uh, easy maneuverability. So I have a serial number on the side of all these cells. It's numbered one through 33, and the best cells of those 33 are the ones that I have here. So I'm gonna go ahead and read the DC voltage. This is approximately 24 hours after bottom balancing. They're all tied together and they were all drawn down to 3.0 volts. And I believe that was on a seven digit multimeter. So I'm gonna go ahead and start reading cell voltages here. This is cell number two and I have 3.046. Cell number five, 3.033. So it looks like these have recovered a little bit. Cell eight, 3.025. Cell nine, I have 3.024. Cell 10, I have 3.025. Cell 11, I have 3.023. Cell 18, 3.035. Cell 19, 3.038. Cell 25, 3.050. Cell 26, 3.0. Four, six. Cell 27, I have 3.0456, somewhere in there. Cell 28, I have 3.026. Cell 30, 3.031. Cell 31, 3.045. This is cell 32. Cell 32 is 3.049. Cell 33, 3.054. So here we are, I've got some cardboard to protect the top of the batteries. I've got a couple of pieces of seal tight half inch ram. Um, all my 14 gauge wire, they're all equal length. I have the wires all in here. I went ahead and drilled four holes for the corners and I made these stack ups. These are all from Ace Hardware, just nylon spacers. So I'm gonna go ahead and stick those in the holes 
and level that guy out go ahead and put the nuts on the bottom now I went ahead and put this on the bottom of this cabinet simply for the fact that I wanted to keep this back plane clear so if I want to add more current sensors or other devices I have space in this cabinet to do so so I'm gonna go ahead and get these wires all put on the balancers and and hooked all up and then I'll be back I'd like to say I have the Fluke 116 meter. I like this meter a lot for voltage measuring. And the one thing that I bought for it that I don't regret one bit are the leads where this part right here can separate. These are a silicone wire. And I would say these leads are nearly tangle free. I've fought for a long time with tangled leads. Every time I want to use my meter, they're just a total mess. And these guys right here, these silicone leads are awesome and they're the ones where you can take off the pokey bits and put on the grabby bits and uh, just carry on with what you want to do so i've actually moved ahead quite a bit i got all the balance leads in uh, i have these little ring terminals on here and the tiny 632 um, bolts and nuts so all these balance leads go back through into the balancers in the control cabinet with the wires all equal length the way this is set up here's our battery negative and we swing around through here snaking back and forth through all the cells and then come back down through and that's how we were able to pull off right here positive and negative at the center uh, just like i had planned on and the reason that's nice is i'm like i said in the other clips i'm right here at my bus bars ready uh, with a short piece of wire connected on ready to go uh, tied in with the rest of the system. Right now it's morning time, there's some sun outside and we're not charging at optimal, it's kind of an overcast sun, um, but I have the set points that the Outback controller is dialed back a little bit. So if we go over to DC amperage, zero it out, I'll turn the light back on for you guys. And you can see right now we're charging at about 26 amps jumping over i still need to clean up this cabinet quite a bit but i wanted to show you guys how i came onto these bus bars i have right here let me back up i still have this um 12 4 8 12. i still have 12 lead acid batteries over here and those are still bust on and the reason for that is a is backup and b one of the concerns since these uh lithium iron phosphate batteries have such an extremely extremely low internal resistance they have zero problem whipping out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of amps and even though these cells are really small i've had to start up the air compressor yesterday on these cells and i i had my meter set on min max mode and i was able to easily surge a 300 amp startup on that five horsepower compressor motor and they didn't care one bit. So one of the concerns is if you just have these inverters off and um, you know the internal capacitors discharge, when you first connect that uh, battery terminal and the inverters are trying to charge up, there's such a huge, huge inrush available that it can actually blow apart the traces on the circuit board. So here is one of the circuit boards out of the inverters. This one specifically is out of this black inverter and I actually had blown it up and got a replacement board from the manufacturer. And you can see some pretty uh, blown transistors, but that, that's not the purpose why I'm showing you this. I'm showing you this because there are these five capacitors and these are 100 volt, 6,800 microfarad capacitors but what the point i'm trying to make is this is i don't remember the positive or negative rail um, and the other one was on the heat sinks directly but either way looking at this board you can see even though they do have a lot of traces in here uh, for the transistor power distribution off this bus bar coming across to the transistors if you look at the traces for the capacitors they're pretty tiny and the leads themselves for the capacitors are, are really thin. If you've ever soldered capacitors, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm going to go ahead and put this to the side. And the problem is with that inrush into those capacitors, when capacitors are discharged, their, their ability to accept charge is extremely high. So they can take hundreds and hundreds of amps. And unfortunately, the leads on the bottom of the capacitor aren't designed for those hundreds and hundreds of amps 
So it'll actually melt or blow up or vaporize those leads on those capacitors and damage your inverter severely. So that is an issue some of the RVers had when they switched to lithium phosphate batteries was the inrush. So what's cool about this system and why I have the fuses and whatnot like I do is I can get these charged up to the 48 volts or whatever off of the lead acid batteries that have the higher internal resistance and can, can kind of self limit how much power they can produce. And then I can connect on the fuse for the lithium batteries and then disconnect this one from the lead acid. And they're okay to be on the same bus briefly because if you figure, the, let's say these are resting at 48 volts and the lithium, or actually let's say 50 volts because that's a good charged voltage for resting. Let's say these are at 50 volts as well. You'll have similar potential, so there won't be very much current flowing between the two. Now, I will say you got to be very careful and wear gloves and, and, and gear as if you're preparing for an arc flash because there could be on your first connection some arcing, so be, be ready for that. This is definitely something that's dangerous and requires an experienced user uh, just because of the fact that there is no real off switch on batteries and there's that potential for arcing. So then, like I was saying, you can charge on the lead acid, connect on the lithium, they're okay for a few minutes on the same bus as long as you're not charging or, or discharging them. And then you can disconnect the lead acid and now the inverters are running perfectly fine. In case I didn't mention it, these are 100 amp hour uh, CALB lithium iron phosphate batteries. I still need to do a bit of work here in my balancing cabinet and part of the result of keeping all the wires on the balancer equal length is now I have a bit of a rat's nest of wiring. But these are the balancers in here. These are actually from a company uh, called Deli Green. I ordered these on the electric car parts uh, company store and I have my transducer and potentiometer, everything in here good. The new potentiometer is installed since I burned up the last one. There's a video on the channel of that. But this cabinet, I'm, I need to still add a few grommets and come out with my negative and, and positive battery leads a bit better. Um, and the reason I have two of these, the, there's a number 12 wire, which is this one, and a number 16 wire, which is this one. The number 12 wire is the current carrying wire that feeds power to the DC to DC converter for the PLC. And the number 16 wire is the voltage sensing line for the transducer um, to make sure we get accurate readings at the bus. I've made a lot of progress this week on my touchscreen panel program. I have basic generator control, and I'm not gonna get super into this, um, but various different things, advanced settings with the password that you can go in, change all your crank times, glow plug times, stuff like that. I'll make a better video on this, but overall getting a lot more uh, different stuff on here. As you can see, I have like nine different screens. Um, I don't want that. So you can look, you know, all this stuff. But I, like I said, I'll get into this later on. Uh, still tweaking this and, and as well as tweaking the PLC software. So more to come on that. I got my contactor in my control cabinet changed. This has a 24 volt DC coil and in now instead of the 24 volt AC coil I had prior. And the problem was with the 24 volt AC coil, when the power would go out, I would no longer have power to close the contactor. And since now I'm running off the DC to DC converter, which is straight off the battery bank, if the, the voltage does get too low and the inverter shuts down, I should still be able to transfer enough power to this contactor and engage the generator and start the batteries. So that was something, this was on Automation Direct. It was about 120 bucks for the contactor and I have the surge suppressing module on the bottom, but definitely something that I needed a long time ago and shouldn't have delayed this long on, but it's there now and things are running happy. I have temporarily a surface for programming I realized when I took it out of the box, doesn't have a Cat5 port. So for programming, I have to have the docking station, a little bit of a mess. And then funny story, when I took this out of the box, it did not have United States as a region. So I had to set it to Canada and, and use French until I could get the updates installed and get English 
on that tablet, which is really interesting for a device sold in the United States. But either way, got a lot of progress this week. I uh, need to close up these panels and do some more cleanup. But yeah, that's, uh, that's where we're at with the lithium batteries. I'm super excited to have these and they're performing amazing and, and I couldn't ask for anything more out of them. I'll see you guys in the next video. Again, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like this video, comment any questions below, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks, bye.